Good morning. Good morning. It's always a pleasure to be able to preach. And it's a special pleasure to be here preaching. As I search God's will in what you have me to do today, it's a combination of a couple things God used in my life. One of the things is uh, how Christianity is perceived today in, in the world and how uh, uh, Christian persecution is growing in this world. It is uh, growing in this country. We start to see uh, things go awry. We hear about the terrorist attack in all different types of, the, of countries around the world. Terrorist hits here, hits there. We see about the natural disasters that happen. And we're starting to wonder if things are turning, but they're not turning in the right direction. We're getting closer to the end times. And I was praying to God, what does the church need? What does the church need? How can we be prepared when we really start seeing persecution hit this country? And basically, it's a message we must be absolutely surrendered. I call it, this message is Absolute, absolute Surrender Part 2. I would normally give that title to Duane, and Duane says, was there a one? <laughs> It was a one. It was a while back. It was probably about a year and a half ago. And I, I plan on going over some of the points that I mentioned in that first message. And the second message is actually a, an add-on to that. Um, it's a different perspective of looking at, at it. And um, you can, we can't talk enough about what it means to be absolutely surrendered to God. We need that today more than ever. We can help the world when the world starts going and still going in the wrong direction, we can make a difference. But we can only make the difference if we're walking in the power of Almighty God. Yeah. Let's pray. Lord Father, I thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be able to come here. I thank you for this message. I know I need to hear this message, Lord. I know, Lord, that we need to continue to grow and get closer to you, Lord. Give us the fullness of your spirit, Lord. May you pour us out of the vessel and you come in this vessel in your fullness, Lord. Make a difference, Lord, with this message in each and every life here, Lord, today. That this, we would be stronger in the faith and that we would make a difference in this world for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Absolute Surrender, Part 2. Uh, this is uh, inspired uh, mostly um, by the Holy Spirit. No. The book, actually, I'm sure it hope it was, right? But the Holy Spirit used this preacher, uh, Andrew Murray, to write several books. And um, I would uh, ask you to look up Andrew Murray's books. They have audio books on YouTube. And you can get regular books to read on the internet. Andrew Murray, Absolute Surrender. And not only that book, if you go to YouTube, you'll see all the different books that's on audio now. Um, this guy really knew how to preach. He really knew, understood the presence of Almighty God in his life. And that's what each and every one of us need to strive for. I'm not satisfied where I am with, with Christ. And I don't ever want to be satisfied. Because I want the fullness of Christ in me, moment by moment, day by day. I see that sometimes. Every moment, every once in a while, I see the Holy Spirit working in me. I'm thinking, praise the Lord. You're being glorified. And that's what we want to do. We want to glorify God. There was, po there was four points basically mentioned in the first message. First point one, why should we absolutely surrender to God? 
and I brought up the fact that his title demands it. God, King, Lord. And God also commands it. Point two, we are unable to absolutely surrender ourselves to him in our own power. John 15, verse 5. Jesus said, I am the vine, here are the branches. He that abided in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. I love that verse. We need total dependence upon the power of God. We need total dependence upon Jesus. We want Jesus to live his life in us. We need to take that seat. Point three we went over was God is able to accomplish this surrendered life in us. Philippians 2, verse 13. One of my favorite verses. I was thinking about, you know, that would be a good verse to put on my tombstone. I keep coming up with different verses. You ever think, <laughs> you ever think about your tombstone? I do. <laughs> Maybe it's my age, I don't know. But there definitely must be a scripture verse on that tombstone. Something. You hear that song? Something. Something. <laughs> But anyway, you check this one out. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God that worketh in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. That's one of my favorite prayers. I pray that continually. I've been praying that probably a lot in the last five years. Do you ever have a prayer that you pray and you wonder if it's being answered and then all of a sudden God opens your eyes up and she tells, she shows you that, hey, I've been answering that. All of a sudden you realize it is being answered now and in the future. Point four. Since God is able to accomplish this, then why are we not absolutely surrendered to him? And I say it's a faith issue. It's a faith issue. We'll look at that this morning. But out of the four points, the one I want to concentrate on is point three. God is able to accomplish this surrendered life in us. Now there's a, there's a danger in the walk as we walk as Christians in this life. And there's a danger of falling back and not looking at things correctly and not, and not, not depending upon the power of God but depending upon our own strength and, 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 and doing our own walk. And, and we see that when we, when we look at um, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians in chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 1 and 3, we see there's a, there's a danger there. They, it says here, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. This is what I want you to know. This is what I, this is what I want you to understand. Receive me the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. How did you come to Christ? This is the same thing we must answer this question if we're going to absolutely surrender to God. How did you come to Christ? Did you come to Christ by the law? By your obedience to the law? No, you didn't. You came to Christ. You were born again because of your faith and the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. You believed and trusted in His power and not your own. You trusted in His righteousness and not your own. So he's saying, look at this. Are you so foolish? Have you begun in the spirit? Are you now made perfect in the flesh? And we can fall in that same category. Once we're saved, we know we're saved. We praise God that we're saved. We understand that we are weak. We understand that God is powerful. But then we go about trying to establish our own righteousness again. We say, well, the law says we can't do this. We can't do that. We can't do this. And the law says we need to do this. We need to do that. And we look at the law. And then we try in our own power to obey the law. And we see ourselves failing. 
It's not us obeying the law. It really isn't. For instance, look, if you obey the law, if you come up to a commandment and it says, thou shalt not do this, and you don't do it, you know what's going to happen? <coughs> Pride is going to build up. Because you're, you're obeying it in your own power. What happens if you don't? If you fail and you fall in the circumstance, then condemnation comes. The law can only bring condemnation or pride. Did you hear that? The law of God can only bring you condemnation when you fail and pride if you succeed. Am I saying don't obey the law of God? God forbid. No, I'm not saying that. It's how you obey the law of God. Are you obeying it in God's power or are you obeying it in the flesh? Because you can walk after the flesh and obey some of the commandments of God. You can. And he will be puffed up. A surrendered life fulfills the law of God. Because a surrendered life is Christ living in you. It's Christ living his life in and through you. And you're, you're stepped aside. You're, 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 you're to the side here. Galatians 5.25 If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You see what he's saying here? He says, if we live in the Spirit. Now, living in the Spirit is being in Christ. If you're saved, you're in the Spirit. The Bible makes it perfectly clear. If you're not in the Spirit, then you don't have Christ. If you're not saved. So the encouragement is because you are in the Spirit, because you are saved, then walk like that. This, it, there, there, there's being, it's being saved. You're, you're saved. You have the power. But then we go back into the flesh and we start putting ourselves under the law again. God does not want you to put yourself under the law. He wants you to put him, yourself under his power and under his control. Because then when you obey the commandments, <coughs> then when you see yourself being holy and doing that which is right, God gets the glory. You praise God. There's no one there to pat you on the back. You can't pat yourself on the back. And when you fail, there will be no condemnation because there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. The exhortation of Scripture is today. Walk in the Spirit. We need to really focus on that. We really need to understand what does that mean in our daily routine in our lives. What is this going to mean tomorrow, Monday morning, when you go to work? Colossians. No, that's not Colossians. Second Corinthians, chapter five, verse seven. For we walk by faith. Not by sight. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Walking under the law is by sight. Walking by faith is looking at Jesus Christ. It's receiving the fullness of Jesus Christ in your life. This is a hard spiritual truth to grasp. Because we are people of sight. We want thou shalt not. We want these things. We want these things in our life. We want to look at the law. And the reason why we want to look at the law is because some things we can easily obey. And then we can be proud of ourselves. <laughs> Don't mention the things that we can't obey, right? Kind of put them off to the side. Nobody's perfect, right? We all sin. We're apologizing. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. I love this verse too. What verse don't you love? <laughs> what did you say that we say the dumbest thing, don't we? <laughs> Ephesians chapter two, verse ten. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You see that? That's not walking by the law. That's surrendering to God and His power. And we are His workmanship. When you see yourself doing something that isn't you, you 
know is God's workmanship, and God gets the glory. This right now, I'm doing right now, okay, is for the glory of God. It's God's workmanship in me. Thank God for that. I, I know myself. My family knows me. You know, God gets the glory. For we are His workmanship. We're not going to be His workmanship if we keep pulling away and trying to do it ourselves. We become our own. We become our own workmanship. I'll make it happen. See, we're a society that, that, that believes uh, uh, to build up your self-esteem. I don't want to build my self-esteem up. I don't want to build yours up. I want to take you down. I want to take you down low. Because the lower you get, the higher you can be with Christ. Jesus humbled himself. He became low. Self-esteem? Forget it. We have all kind of churches. We have all kind of teaching in the churches. to try to build oneself up. No, you need to be taken down. You need to be taken down when you were saved. And you need to be taken down as a Christian so God can lift you up. Colossians 2, verse 6. As you have therefore received Christ. Listen to what it's saying now. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Again, how did you receive him? That's the only way you can walk and glorify God doing it. By faith. By trust. Not by our works. Not by our strength. Total faith and trust in his power to bring us to the absolute surrendered life. Let's look at our condition in Christ for a moment. Romans chapter 6, verse 11 through 12. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Reckon yourself to be dead unto sin. Sin brings condemnation. The strength of sin is a law. We're dead unto that. In other words, there's no relationship there. Therefore, there is no condemnation because we're dead to sin. There's a lot of spiritual stuff going on here that I find very hard to understand. You know, this, this is one of the verses that I know Pastor Ed loved. And he preached it here several times. I remember that. Verse 12. Let us not, let, let not, see, because we are dead to sin, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. That's a call to holiness. That's a call to understanding who you are in Christ now. God made you fit for heaven. You didn't make yourself fit. And God can make you fit as you walk day by day. He will do it. And he can do it. But will you believe that he will do it? Because believing that he will do it, and he will do it now, is the way of getting there. That's the answer. That's the answer for all of us, is believing that he will do it. Not that he just can do it. I mean, how many people think are saved, believing that Christ can save them? You don't get saved by believing that Christ can save you. You get saved by truly believing that Christ can save you. I'm not sure about that one, Wayne. Put that, on, put that on, uh, on the burner, man. Maybe I'll explain it a little bit better later. Verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. The flesh, the lust is against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. There's a war, a continual war going on. Okay? Neither, verse 13, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Yield your members, your hands, your eyes, your feet, your way you walk, the way you speak. Don't yield this to the flesh. Yield this to the spirit. Lord, we sing that one song. With that one song, take my eyes, take my ears, take my, my tongue, take everything, and I give it to you. And then he controls it. Jesus wants to live his resurrected life in you. Let 
Neither, verse 13 again, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. That's what surrender is all about. It's a yielding. We see it as a walk. Now I'm a Christian. I must walk like a Christian. I must do this. I must not do this. It's a, it, you see what the difference is? You see how that's different than yielding? Yielding is letting God do it in you. It's important to understand the difference here. Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. How does that happen? By your strength? It happens by yielding. Only by yielding. Romans chapter 1, verse 17 through 22. Romans 1, verse 17 through 22. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Your walk will come about through surrendering to God. Your victory over sin will come about, not trying to keep from sin, but by submitting to Almighty God and His power. Sin, you will see sin leave your life as you surrender to God. And it's, and it's a moment by moment thing. We've got to keep on doing it. We've got to keep on doing it. We are a vessel. We are a cup, a vessel. What's in that cup? Self or the Holy Spirit? Is this cup half full with self? Then it can only be half full with the Spirit. We want the fullness of the Spirit. If we want the fullness of the Spirit in our vessel, then God needs to empty the cup. And there's an answer to that emptying that we're going to get to in a minute. How do we receive this surrendered life? God answered that to me. He's been working in my life for many, many years, but just recently I realized the importance of this one word when it comes to being surrendered to God. We'll hear that word in just a second. Verse 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Did you hear that? The righteousness of God without the law. That's Jesus in you. That's not, that's not putting yourself under the law. It's putting yourself under grace where you belong. Okay? The righteousness of God is the rightness of God. It's the walk. It's the holy life of God can be in you. You can live this out. You can live this out. You remember what Christ said? You ever read that verse in the Bible that says, um, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And he's performing these miracles. And the disciples are in awe. And then Jesus looked at him and said, greater things you can do. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you can do more than I have done. And I read that verse and I said, all right. Our lack of, our lack of faith, our dwelling in unbelief. Do you think you can do greater things than Jesus? Jesus said it. All we have to do is allow God in and self be cast out. Self needs to be cast out, not built up. Listen to the sermons today in, in the pulpits in America. It's about lifting self up, not about glorifying God and lifting God. Most of it's about self esteem, it's about lifting yourself up. Again, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ and all and upon all them that believe. Righteousness is only received by believing. The true righteousness. You either try to earn righteousness by obeying the law, or you receive the true righteousness of God by faith. And what we want to do is receive the true righteousness of God. Not to know that we're saved, but to continue in salvation, to continue to live a holy, righteous life. 
You just can't stop at the moment of being saved and then throw away the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God must live in you and through you. And that's Jesus in you. That's Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, verse 19 through 29. You know, when Paul wrote to the Colossians here, he's explaining a little bit about Jesus. But at the end, you'll see what it is to be totally surrendered to God. Do you think Paul was totally surrendered to God? <laughs> his, his life pretty much showed it, didn't it? And you'll see some words at the end of, 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 of the scriptures here, I think it will help us. Verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in him, speaking of Jesus, should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, rather they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. You see all the work that God has done and is willing to do in you and continue to do in you. And this work will continue in you as long as you will live by faith and not by sight. He makes this right. He makes us fit for heaven. And he will make us that Christian that we need to be. He'll make us that light in the world and the, because the world needs light. The world needs the Christians to be on fire right now. Verse 23, if you continue in faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, where I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. We're going to get close to the word, and I'm I'm going to reveal that in a minute that brings us to a surrendered life. Suffering is part of that explanation. Paul suffered mightily. There was a lot of suffering in Paul's life, but there was a reason for that suffering. And I'll tell you that in a moment. There's a reason for suffering in this world. My life, spiritually, has been a struggle for the last five years. I've gone through a lot of suffering, and I'll get into that a little bit, maybe. But God opened my eyes up to why that it needed to happen. God opened my eyes up why also that it will continue to happen as long as self is still ruling. Who re who, verse 24, who now rejoice in my suffering for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery, I don't know what this mystery is all about here, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is, what is the mystery? Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what we're preaching on this morning. How much of Christ is in you? How much of Christ is in us? Is it 20%? 40%, 60%, 100 You know, there's terms in the Bible we talk about in Christ. We are in Christ. That, that preposition in denotes a fixed position. To be in, think about this now. We are in Christ. But the question I have for you today is, how much of Christ is in you? It's two different things going on here. To be in Christ is your security and your salvation. You are secure. You're saved once and for all. That's it. God did the work. You trust in that work. You're saved. But now we have the walk. And the walk depends upon how much Christ is in you. 
That's what the wealth depends upon. Again, verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Ah, oh, that verse. Verse 27. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereof, whereunto I also labor, striving. Now this is this one I want you to get. What's Paul saying? Whereunto I also labor. But now let me define what the labor is. Striving according to his working. The work that he's doing, the labor he's doing, is by the power of Almighty God. He's saying it right here, according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. That's why God gets the glory in Paul's life. This is why God can get the glory in your life. When he does the working in you, when you yield moment by moment in his power. Psalm 71, verses 15 and 16. My mouth shall show forth your righteousness and your salvation all the day. For I do not know how many babies are. I will go in the strength of the Lord Jehovah. I will speak of your righteousness of yours alone. Isn't that a beautiful song? How can that be true in your life? How can that be true in our lives? By yielding to the power of God. That's what it will look like. That's what your life can look like. Full of praises. So how do we get to this place of holiness? One of the tools, and this is just one of the tools, that God has revealed to me and has used it in my life. One of the tools that God uses to give us this type of life is the word humility. God will be bringing events in your life that will humble you. And it will hurt. Amen. And I'll tell you one thing. These events is what God is doing with these events that humble us, things that happen in our life that humble us. It's God taking you, that, that vessel, and pouring you out so more of Him can be in. God wants to humble you. We need to desire to be humble. You know, you hear the thing in the church uh, don't pray for patience. You ever hear that? Pray for, you know why? <laughs> tribulation, right? We hear that all the time. I hope you're praying for patience. You need that tribulation. And we need to be humble. We need to be humble. And now that I understand what it means to be humble, now that I understand that I need to have events in my life to humble me, to continue to humble me, I need events in my life to do this. Because that's what God uses to bring His glory, to put His glory in me. That he may be glorified through this vessel. Hmm. Well, we had a uh, elders retreat last year. We had one this year, I assume. And uh, we were all sitting there, and, and Dwayne was talking. Dwayne said, "Now what we're going to do now is we're going to wash each other's feet." Now, washing somebody's feet will humble you. <laughs> What the elders found out, receiving it is just as humbling as giving it, giving it, right? That's what we found out. There's one person that did not partake in that. One person, not all the others. <laughs> You're looking at him. <laughs> Dwayne, if I have to be able to be humble to the elder, the elder retreat this year, I'm saying right now, I want to wash your feet, brother. And I'm sorry I didn't join. But you know that? that hum you guys experienced an event that helped God pour a little bit of you out and put a little more of him in. And I missed that. I missed it. I missed it. And that's all right. But I had other events in my life. God used 
people, he used organizations, and he will bring you down. He will humble you. And while you're going through that hurt and that pain, because what it is, why, why do we have pain? Because we're, it's dying the self. That's what dying the self is all about. It's painful. Take up that cross daily. Follow me. It's hurtful. It's needful. We're very much needful. <coughs> Who's the most humble person we know about? It's Jesus one. He didn't need events in his life to humble him. He came in his world already humble, didn't he? And he lived a humble life to show us why humility is so important to have. Why humility is one of the tools that God will bring, if you would just ask him, that he would bring it in your life and he will cast out you and put him in. And that's what I want. I want that so bad. How bad do you want that? How much do you want that? Because it hurts, it's hurtful. It's hard to be on that cross. It's hard to die to self. But we must do that. We saw Jesus live as a servant. We saw Jesus wash the disciples' feet. We saw him be obedient. We saw that he was accused. What does the scripture say? He opened not his mouth. Can how hard would it be us for us not to defend ourselves when we're being falsely accused? Jesus was falsely accused to Herod, to, to Pilate, and he opened not his mouth. Opened not his mouth. Could we do that? Only by the grace of God, right? Only by the power of God, only by Jesus living in us. Because we want to defend self. Self is still here. Hey, I don't want to be falsely accused and not defend myself. Jesus didn't defend himself. You know why? He was fully surrendered to the Father, right? Everything he did. He said, I do not my own will, but the Father who sent me. If we just look at Jesus' life, you can understand what true humility is. And what it is to be truly surrendered to God. What it is. That book, um, Absolute Surrender. He also wrote another book, Andrew Murray, called Humility. And that's what inspired this teaching today. This is um, just two sentences out of his book I'm going to read to you. I'd like to read your whole book. I don't even have time. <laughs> this is what he says. Until we make humility our main joy and welcome it at any price, there is very little hope of a faith that will overcome it. World. When Jesus calls us to deny ourselves and follow him, this is what he means that we admit that self has no value except as an empty vessel for God to fill. This is just a very small portion of that book, and I would ask you to follow up this message by giving that book, or listening to the audio book on YouTube, Humility, by Andrew Murray. This man, I, I think, understood what it was to surrender to God. And he understood the tool that God uses to humble someone. All right? I just like to close by, after I explain to you how hurtful humility is, <laughs> let me close by giving you an uplifting scripture on humility. Matthew chapter 18, verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as a little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 23, 12. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, but he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. James 4, 6. But he gives more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. We want that grace. That's Christ in us. That's what grace is. Christ in us. James 4.10 Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. As we think about closing, we offer this altar to you today. You are hurting. 
if you're need someone to pray with you, bring someone with, with you. There'll be people up front to pray with you. If you're joyful, we want to share that joy with you. Come up, tell us about it. You need help. You need Christ. You need to be a have that surrendered life. We'll be glad to pray with you. Use this altar for God's glory today. And I hope that God has used this message to open your heart and your minds of the desperate need we have to be humble. Let's pray.